uh, just a quick summary of what you, how would you view evolution? Can you say that one more time? Give me a, uh, just, that's okay. Give me a uh, short summary definition of, of what is evolution. Short summary definition. It's the thought that, the theory that um, things start off very simple and they slowly over a long amount of time uh, evolve to something more complicated, something more, I would say, civilized in our case, theoretically. Um, that's about as simple as I could get. Okay. There are, there are a couple of different types of evolution. Dean, tell me what is microevolution. Uh, microevolution is just the uh, change within a species like uh, dogs. If two different types of dogs breed, they can, they can produce a different type of dog, but that's not going to become something else other than a dog. Okay. Microevolution is true or false? True. 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 It's very much true. It happens. We know that it happens. You can change, for instance, if I wanted to breed violets or pea plants or, or certain things for certain characteristics, we know we can do that today. We can, we can have changes within limited parameters. The key point, though, is those limited parameters. I can never take a, a violet plant and make it into a mammal or an amphibian or a reptile or whatever. Uh, in fact, I can't even take it out of, out of the violet family. Who would you say was responsible for bringing evolution, putting it in our lap? Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin. Was he the first and only? No. No, absolutely not. In fact, I want to make sure all of you guys understand something. Charles Darwin, basically, in my, my estimation, he was one of the biggest cheats in, in the scientific field that's ever existed. Charles Darwin, he took this voyage on the HMS Beagle. He saw some things he didn't quite understand. Long story short, he was very, very sick the majority of his life. There's a lot of questions as to what he actually had, whether it was maybe a, uh, an immune disorder, whether he, he had some kind of a malaria, or tuberculosis, whatever. He's in his house pretty much all the time. He's corresponding with other scientists. One of the other scientists that he was corresponding with was a guy named Russell Alfred Wallace. Russell Alfred Wallace was in a scientific environment down in Borneo. He sent Charles Darwin and a, another fellow friend of Charles Darwin's a manuscript to read that actually laid out natural selection. It said, look, this is how I think things are changing. Charles Darwin gets it. He basically freaks out because he realizes this guy is going to be the first to publish something that he's kind of been mentally thinking about. So he calls the, the guy that got the other manuscript, and together they form this plan. They decide that, yes, they're going to submit Alfred Russell Wallace's paper, but they're also going to submit one of Charles Darwin's papers with it so that they'll appear published simultaneously. And then Charles Darwin took the next step of citing a reference that was older than any of Wallace's. And in science, basically what that does is that means you've got dibs. Your stuff is older. You've worked on it longer. It's further researched. And so guess whose name got out there first? Darwin's. You know, when I say Alfred Russell Wallace today, people are kind of like, what are you talking about? Who are you talking about? The reality of it is Wallace came up with it first. Charles Darwin basically just beat him to the punch because Wallace was in a third world nation and didn't have the ability to, to get the stuff in the press too soon. It's really tragic, too, that he trusted Charles Darwin to get this paper into a manuscript form, and instead of Charles Darwin doing what he was supposed to do, he basically kind of cut this guy's legs out from under him. Do I think that evolution would have come up even without these men? Absolutely. 
you know, there was enough stuff out there that was going on that eventually somebody's going to stumble across this idea. Um, there was a, a book that Charles Darwin was reading while he was on the boat that was talking about geography. Uh, it was written by a guy by the name of Lyle. That particular book was one of the first books to suggest old ages. And it was in that book that he laid down all this idea that, hey, maybe each one of these different layers was put down during a different age. And that's kind of what helped Charles Darwin getting his mind thinking into this whole ancient period type of deal. But the point being, it was going to come around one way or another, whether it was through Charles Darwin or not. Somebody tell me what you know about Charles Darwin. He at one time a, a minister or somehow involved in some sort of clergy system? Absolutely. Dean, yes, you're right. He doesn't have a degree in science. Or he doesn't have a degree in science. What's his only degree in? Theology. Preaching. <laughs> he basically was sitting right where you guys are. Here's the funny part. Charles Darwin, I'm going to, actually, I'm going to swap over to, uh, to some PowerPoints right now just so you guys can see this on the thing, those of you who are taking notes. Charles Darwin. <laughs> Is that funny? Oh, no, Jerry was just looking at me. It's like, I got my eye on him. I got my own Dean because if Darwin goes that way, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just keep my eye on him, that's all. <laughs> That's all right. I, I got my own in too, so. Um, okay. No love. Here's what you need to know about Charles Darwin. His mom died when he was eight years old. His father and his grandfather were both physicians. So you can imagine growing up in that house how much pressure there was for this young man to become a physician. His dad sends him off to, now I put on here, these are the men that definitely helped shape Darwin's worldview. They molded him into the man that he would become. Because think about it. You don't have mom around. Dad and granddad are there. They're both physicians. What do they expect him to become? A doctor. So they send him off to the University of Edinburgh at the age of 16 to study medicine. Now, again, remember, this is in the mid-1800s. Actually, it's in the early 1800s. And anesthesia was not around. And so one of, the, one of the duties of a physician back then was to physically hold down patients as they were being cut open for surgery. You can imagine that was not exactly the most clean, the most septic, the most pleasant experience. Charles Darwin literally couldn't hack it. He couldn't hack the blood. He couldn't hack the screaming. And so he calls home and he basically tells dad, look, this, this profession is not me. So his dad, needing to save the family name, realizes there's about only one other job that he could take, that he could do, where basically the family could say, oh, he's had a, a, a higher calling or he's, you know, yes, he wants to be a physician, but he, he's, he's on a different career path. Well, you can't do that if you're a toilet repairman. <laughs> but you can do that if you're a preacher. And so his dad says, you know what, we're going to send you off to Cambridge for you to study to become a preacher, a priest. And so he did. That's the place where he got his only degree was at Cambridge University. And, in fact, it was in divinity. So, you know, it's kind of ironic. The guy who gets all the credit for being the, the father of the evolutionary theory, one of the best scientists, realistically, his only degree is in, in Bible. While he's there, he ran into a guy by the name of John Stephen Henslow, who Henslow was a priest. He was one of the faculty members, but he was also a botanist. He collected plants. And Darwin and Henslow would go out frequently on the weekends and collect things together. Plants, animal species. And Henslow realized Charles Darwin had a great knack for collecting these things. He got him a position 
as a volunteer naturalist on a boat the summer that he graduated. So you guys are second year students, you're, you're looking at graduating, you can imagine if you come to me and I say, hey, I got you this cool job, you're going to be on a boat for two years, everything is paid, you're not going to be paid, but you get free room and board, and all you got to do is collect specimens. The boat trip lasted five years instead of two. And on that particular boat trip, if you really read his, uh, his diary, what you find out is Charles Darwin was majorly prone to seasickness. I mean, he was sick almost all the time that boat was moving. Basically, it was a situation where they would land somewhere. He would try to get enough strength to get out, collect something. Then he would get back in his hammock because he's, all he was doing was throwing up all over the place. They circle around the Cape of Africa. They come down around the Cape of South America. They come up on the west side of it. And about 500 miles off the coast of Ecuador in South America is a group of islands known as the Galapagos Islands. They hit those islands, and it was there where Charles Darwin saw all kinds of amazing creatures. And it's literally, guys, it's a, it's a place where time has not affected it much. He, ironically, in his book, Charles Darwin described it as antediluvian. What does that mean? Before the flood. Before the flood. You got Charles Darwin describing these islands as looking like it, it, it was before the flood. It's there that you can see things like, for instance, these marine-going iguanas, the only place in the world where you'll see them. You see those massive turtles that you can literally ride on their backs. But it was also there that he saw the finches. Thirteen finches, we now refer to them as Darwin's finches. If you look at each one of these, I'm going to try my best to, to point this out. You got this guy right here. He's got a really sharp pointed beak, top right corner. You look down here, this guy's got a very thick, broad beak. Each one of their beaks, you can tell, is a little bit different. Each one of their colorations may be a little bit different. Charles Darwin, he collected these 13 species. He ships them back to England. When he gets back there, he starts looking at them and he realizes... He says, basically says to himself, you know, God would not purposefully create 13 finches. Surely all of these finches are the result of one pair that got to the island that breeded and then resulted in all 13 of these. That was kind of the beginning of his whole idea about this evolutionary tree. What's the problem with that thinking? Can you say that again, Brad? Yeah, what's, what's the problem with him extrapolating the existence of everything from these finches? In other words, Charles Darwin's got 13 finches. He builds this, this diagram that's got all these branches coming off of it. What's the problem with that? goes back to what we were talking about earlier. I asked Dean to describe microevolution. Yes. You got changes within the finch family. Not a problem. That's true. It happens. But he was trying to then apply that branch that he had drawn to all animal species. And he basically said that his branch was a single branch on an entire tree of life. And that all living things, therefore, had a common trunk or a common ancestor. Something that we'd never seen before. Comments, questions, thoughts so far? Interesting that, yep, uh, interesting that he thought that, well, two finches became, oh, never mind. I was thinking wrong. I was thinking he was paralleling the line of. Two mocha color people coming up with 16 blood clouds. Well, I mean, in, in a way, it's, that's, that's a good point. 
you've got all these different varieties of fish that could have come from just two, an original two, kind of like same thing with human beings. Uh, I got a chance to go to the Galapagos Islands about, about a year ago. It is definitely not a place that you want to go as a resort. Uh, do not take your wife there for a vacation. Very, very difficult to get to. Very, very third world. Um, they don't have any kind of, of restaurant chains, hotel franchises. It's, it's still fairly primitive. And, um, you know, in a way that's good because the, the wildlife that we got to see was undisturbed. But, as far as traveling and getting around and doing what we were trying to do, it was it was pretty tough. Um, you're talking about a very very serious bushland third world kind of situation. Comments, thoughts, questions. All right. Somebody tell me the name of Charles Darwin's book. You ought to miss that question. Oh, Man, I should have put that on the test. Talks about, talks about favorite races. Talks about favorite races. Is that the full part title? Of, it's a part of the title, <laughs> yeah. I don't know the full title, but I know it has something in there about favorite races. All right, let's look at the full title. <laughs> the full title is called The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. <laughs> Or the preservation of favored races in the struggle of life. They have obviously cut off the last part of that title today. You don't, when you go and buy one of these, you don't exactly uh, buy. You don't buy a book that's got that in there. But long story short. What do you think that full title means? Hey, Brad. Yes. I kind of see where uh, where you're where you're going with the title. Yep. But can't that just mean with regards to the favored races of finches or favored races? Oh, absolutely. Of absolutely. Okay. And it doesn't mean, believe it or not, it's not necessarily meaning human beings, although he hints at it. The reason I say it doesn't mention human beings is because in this book, he purposely left human beings out. He, he throws everybody kind of a, a little hook and says, well, I think all of this also can be translated into the human race, human family line. I'm not dealing with that here. Now, he did deal with it in his second book, and that was The Descent of Man, where, again, he played the same card of, you know, there are different races, different uh, superiorities, inferiorities, or whatever. But it's in this book that he gave three mechanisms of how he thought evolution worked. There are the three the mechanisms on the screen. You got acquired characteristics. Adaptation and natural selection. The first two guys we know today in the year 2010, we know that they are unscientific. Basically, you know, nicely put, it's garbage. The first acquired two? character, the first two. Acquired characteristics means quite literally what it says, and that is that you acquire the characteristics of your parents. So, for instance, if, if Jerry were blind, according to Darwin's theory, all of his children would be blind. Or if Chuck had a, a paralyzed arm, then all of his children would be expected to have a paralyzed arm. He used the acquired characteristics thing to, to basically back up this idea, like, for instance, giraffes have a long neck. And his idea was that with each successive generation, because these animals were hunting for food and the only leaves left were the leaves in the tops of the trees, that they acquired this characteristic from their parents to have a long neck. Well, that's total garbage. We know it's garbage today. How do we know that's garbage? Well, 
when the giraffes guys think about re say that again sorry when the giraffes had died before they could reach the first one could reach the you know the okay, yeah no. absolutely where does the where does it actually begin um, uh, the, the acquiring of the characteristics um, I don't know if I can say that any better Okay, think about this. Your cell, the cells that are used for reproduction. Your your wife, when she is physically born, she already has all of the eggs that she will ever have her entire life. So the DNA that she is going to pass on in those eggs is already literally set from the, her moment of birth. The DNA that you pass on through sperm is made in your testicles. Those two come together, and that is what is going to determine the genetic makeup of the next generation. So here's my point. If I get paralyzed in my arm, does that, that genetic material, does it make it to my sperm cells? No, no. The answer is absolutely not. Or if your wife becomes blind during old age, does that information ever get to into the egg cells? The answer is no. The egg cells have already been made. Yeah, Dean? What about like things like the history of cancer where you have generation after generation that get cancer? Wouldn't that be something that would be like an acquired characteristic since? That is a, what we call a genetic disposition. Meaning, your, let's say your family lineage has a, a predisposition for breast cancer. That means for whatever reason, you have got proteins or you have got uh, markers in your DNA that are making you more susceptible with both environmental factors, with stress factors, with physiological factors that would make you a lot more prone or somebody in your family more prone to having breast cancer than maybe in my family. Okay. But is that an acquired characteristic? Does that mean that, that because your mom has it, everybody in the family lineage from that point on is going to have it? No. Okay. Well, There's a difference in, in passing something on for certain versus passing on a genetic predisposition. Okay. Um, I don't know. I don't want to get off topic, but I was – that's all right. I was just going to ask you, well, if that's the case regarding cancer, <clears throat> what about the disposition to be homosexual? There is no gay gene. But the, is there a cancer gene? Like, I'm just wondering, is there a cancer gene that says you're going we to... Think, yeah, we think that in certain types of cancer, there actually is, there are genetic uh, markers, yes. But it, Dean, think about this. If you have two identical twins, identical twins, the way that it works, guys, is you've got a single egg that while it is implanting in the mother's womb, it literally splits in two and becomes two individuals. Their DNA could not be more identical. I mean, they are literally sharing the exact same genetic material. Now, when they're born, if one of those becomes homosexual and there is a gay gene, what does the other one have to be? Homosexual. Has to be homosexual. And yet, in all the twin studies, guess what? That's not the case. I, I'll say this very quickly. It's just to make sure we don't get off topic. But to answer Dean's question, there were four major studies that were done in the 1990s that you guys, I'm sure, you may not be familiar with the names of the studies, but you're familiar with the, what the results were. And that is they tried very hard to say, hey, look, we've got a genetic basis for homosexuality. Well, what the media has not come back to tell you is that of those studies, two of them were performed by very known, way out of the closet homosexuals who had an agenda. Nobody has been able to replicate two of the findings, and the twin study actually, if anything, it proves that it's not a genetic deal. So we've gone back and we've looked at all these four studies that were done in the early 90s, 
And the reality of it is that there is no gay gene. That's not to say that there aren't some men out there who are more effeminate or more ladies who maybe have more testosterone and are more masculine or what we sometimes call butch-like, so to speak. Does that mean that they're homosexual? Absolutely not. Dean, the way that you can know this beyond a shadow of a doubt, when you lay your head down tonight, remember that Paul wrote to the Corinthians, and he gave them a long list of activities they've been doing, and he said, thus were some of you, meaning they had changed. If you can change that behavior, it's not genetic. You know, one of the things that drives me crazy is people... The homosexuals are trying to ride in on the, the coattails of the civil liberties movement, the civil rights movement. And, you know, here again, I'm not, we're not trying to point out, quote, race things, but Jerry and Dean cannot change their race color. I mean, you can't. You physically, I mean, you can try to use some kind of makeup or something, but you can't physically change that. Paul is saying that you can change things like homosexual behavior. You can change that you were a liar, a thief, or a whatever. That tells me it's not genetic. There's no way it was genetic. All right. All right? Okay, back to our list. Remember I said that, that Charles Darwin, he gave three mechanisms. The first was acquired characteristics. Guys, that's no good. In fact, let me throw up a... Uh, a slide that better details that. While I'm doing that, if somebody has a question, I have a question. or comment, I, I kind of going back to, to Dean's question about cancer. Um, yeah. Is anything in our genetic code rewritten um, um, that would make us more prone to those diseases, rather than maybe what what Darwin was saying about you know, if, if you break your arm or or, or or if your arm is paralyzed, then your kid will have a paralyzed arm. Say that again. Sorry. I'm not sure. Um, basically, uh, do diseases like, like cancer or, or AIDS uh, uh, rewrite anything in our genetic code that would make our children more, more prone or susceptible to those things? The short answer is yes, there are certain things that, that they can do. Um, I'm trying to give you a, a really great example, but I, let me throw out a couple of medium examples. We know that certain disorders, diseases fall in family lines, and once they get in those family lines, a lot of times they are passed on for multiple generations. We believe that things like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, that there may be a genetic factor in those. Meaning, if you have a family member that has it, you are at increased odds, and your children are at increased odds. Um, things like color blindness stick in a family, and there has to be some kind of a genetic component with that. Let me think, what else? Obviously, what about something like high blood pressure, congestive heart failure? Very, very common for families to run in these particular deals where you've got a granddad who died of a heart attack. Now you've got his, his son who is on uh, Lipitor, Cardizem, whatever, trying to, to keep his under check. And lo and behold, he's got a 30-year-old son who realizes now that his cholesterol is higher. And so it's a, it's a family deal where something has gotten into that particular family. Um, let me, I'm having trouble pulling up my, uh, this PowerPoint that I'm wanting. Give me just a moment. Try this way. Any 
Any other thoughts, comments, questions while I'm looking for this? All right, let's, let's talk about the next one while I'm pulling this up. The next one is adaptation. Why is adaptation not a great... Scientific mechanism for evolution. I'll give you what Charles Darwin said. He gave the example of polar bears. And he said that polar bears were adapted to their environment. What's the problem with saying that? He doesn't necessarily know where they, where they came from originally. He doesn't know that the polar bear wasn't originally uh, in its environment that he's talking about. Okay. So what happens if, for instance, we take a polar bear. Here we go. This is what I'm looking for right here. If we take a polar bear and we put it on an airplane and we put it in the St. Louis Zoo or the Denver Zoo, what is that polar bear going to do? We can out stay white. He's going to adapt to his new environment, is he not? Or he then has babies in the Denver Zoo. You put one of those babies on a plane, you send him back up north to the North Pole. You put one of those babies on a plane, you send him to San Diego Zoo. What are they both going to do? Adapt to the environment. Adapt. But have they actually changed? No. No, absolutely not. Brad, so the, the point... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Would that be more like acclimating to where they're at as opposed to what they're talking about as far as completely changing? Absolutely. Adaptation is not a mechanism to physically change you from one thing into the next. It is simply a, a animal or a plant's ability to survive in that environment. So that doesn't really do you any good. Um, you know, a polar bear can adapt to be anywhere as long as you give him the right amount of food and the, the right conditions. So adaptation doesn't get Charles Darwin anything. They have thrown those out, which only leaves natural selection as the driving force. Here's what has happened in our lifetime, and let me see if this has got this on here real quick. Brad, I've got a question. Yeah. Hold, on, hold on just a second. All right. Hold your question. There we go. Take a look at this, this uh, slide with me. In his book, Origin of Species, Charles Darwin noted, I think there can be little doubt that use in our domestic animals strengthens and enlarges certain parts, and disuse diminishes them and that such modifications are inherited. In other words, he's basically saying if, if a horse uses its legs and it runs and it's a, an athletic horse, it is going to pass on that to the next family. But is that the case? If, if a horse has got massive strength, does that automatically mean that his kids are going to have massive strength? The answer is what? No, absolutely not. Okay, Dean, you had a question, comment? Uh, yeah, as far as uh, adaptation, because a lot of people, when you look at these um, these trees of life within just one uh, species or whatnot, like, for instance, the horse or the whale or anything like that, they would say that these things had to adapt to progress, but I guess my, my question is, would I be right in, in saying that just because you have that, that they can't prove that that uh, small horse adapted into that big horse because of an environment? Right. Because, here's how we prove that, Dean. If that is the case, you should be able to take ten horses that are all the same breed, say quarter horses, 
put all ten of those horses in a different environment, whether it be North Pole, Equator, whatever you want to put them in, on an island, and you ought to see physically changing generations. But you don't see it. They're still quarter horses. The reason why they're still quarter horses is because the reproductive cells are still patterned for quarter horses. Just because they're in, you know, just because this horse gets a beach and this one gets an ice zone, it doesn't change the DNA in those sex cells. Right. That, that makes sense? Okay. Yep. All right. Now let's get into the meat of this thing. We've kind of given some background. I'm now going to switch you up and look at what is what are some of these evolutionary hoaxes. Um, there we go. This is a standard definition. I would like for you guys to, to at least kind of have a working knowledge of this definition versus microevolution. According to the evolutionary model, the universe is completely self-contained. That is to say, the universe is all that exists. There is no first cause, no superintending intelligence, no divine guidance that is responsible for what we see around us. Rather, the universe and all of its complex systems, including all non-human organisms, man, etc., can be explained on the basis of random, chance, naturally occurring processes occurring over eons of time. We've already talked a little bit about the difference between micro and macro. We know micro is true. Macro is false. One of the things that you need to drop down in your notes is this. Because we know that two of Darwin's mechanisms are wrong, we're now living under a time what, in what is called neo-Darwinism, the new Darwinist. New Darwinists have basically abandoned the idea of acquired characteristics and adaptation, and instead they have substituted in mutations, time, chance, and natural selection. But again, I would point out time and chance. Chance doesn't physically cause anything to, like if I, if I roll two dice, there's a chance to both be sixes. Does the word chance actually cause those dice to be sixes? Chance does in itself does not act on the dice. It's just a word we use to talk about odds. So chance is unscientific. Time itself actually goes against evolution because time, according to the laws of physics, says things ought to be moving to a less complex state or a more disordered state over time, evolution requires it to become more complex over time. That only leaves them mutations and natural selection. We'll talk a little bit about both of those. All right. In order to, to look at some of these hoaxes, what we're going to do is I'm going to show you a couple of portions of a lesson that I do called Was Darwin Wrong? Some of you have already seen some of this, so bear with me. There was a magazine that appeared not too long ago. Basically, they, it was the National Geographic. It said, was Darwin wrong? They said evolution was a theory that you can take to the bank. They said the supporting evidence is abundant, various, ever-increasing, solidly interconnected, easily available in museums, popular books and textbooks, mountainous accumulation of other peer-reviewed scientific studies. No one needs to, no one should accept evolution merely as a matter of faith. I, I'm not going to go deeply into this. I would point out the writer of this thing, he had absolutely no training in biology. 33-page documentary in National Geographic. He gave an interview where he said, I did my graduate work on William Faulkner. My training was all in literature, not biology. But when I couldn't make it as a fiction writer, which I'd say he's a great fiction writer, he said, I turned to this. Like the more I get to talk to biologists, walk through the rainforest, see the world. All right, what did they find? Uh, let's see if I can get my computer going the right direction. All right, 
Here is the uh, the first line out of the editorial of this National Geographic. <laughs> Says humans are not descended from apes, but then Charles Darwin never claimed we are. Somebody tell me why you think they included that in the magazine. Because Darwin wrote a book saying that we were. Okay, but why do you think the editors of National Geographic put this in there, and, and why did they start their editorial off with this? What are they trying to do right here? Say that again, James. I just said defend Darwin. I would, I would offer to you that they are basically trying to extend an olive branch because they know that this is such a this is such a controversial topic. They're fixing to get hammered, and so basically they try to start out by saying, "Look, he didn't say we're from apes." But I'm going to show you that, in fact, he did. We'll take a break. We'll be back in just a few minutes.